January 30th of 2023, at 2.30 in the afternoon, George Allen Kelly walked out of his house armed with an AK-47 semi-automatic assault rifle and a 40 caliber handgun, and he opened fire on an unarmed man and an unsuspecting man. Y'all hear me better now? As I was saying, Mr. Kelly, armed with an AK-47 semi-automatic assault rifle and a 40 caliber handgun, walked out of his house and opened fire on two unarmed men who were unsuspecting. Those men were 115 yards away from Mr. Kelly and his residence. That's the length of a football field. Those men, Daniel Ramirez and Gabriel Quinn Guzimana, posed no threat to Mr. Kelly and no threat to his wife. They were walking parallel to the Kelly residence, headed back to the United States-Mexico border. Before firing on those men, George Allen Kelly gave no verbal warnings of any kind. He had no interaction of any kind with these men. Out of nowhere, without saying a thing, without any legal justification, George Allen Kelly let off a barrage of semi-automatic assault rifle fire at these two men. He stood on his back patio and he shot that semi-automatic assault rifle through the patio, across a fence line, through a pasture where he keeps his horse, across another fence line, and across a dirt road, and into the back of Gabriel Quinn Pukimana. Now Daniel Ramirez was just steps away from his companion when he saw Gabriel shot in the back and he saw Gabriel fall to his death. Daniel had to run for his life because the shots were still ringing out all around him. The state anticipates that Daniel will come here to tell you about what happened to him that day. Ladies and gentlemen, that is State versus George Allen Kelly in a nutshell. On the screen you see in front of you, on your right, you see a still photo of the video interview of George Allen Kelly on the day of the murder. On the left is a photograph of the view from George Allen Kelly's back patio as you look out toward the area where Gabriel fell and died. <coughs> this is a photograph of Gabriel Quinn Bukimeo. And I'm gonna ask you to do something in this case that George Allen Kelly's own words tell you that he did not do. I'm gonna ask you to consider Gabriel Quinn Bukimeo as a person, as a human being, and not as George Kelly described him, as an animal. Now again, this is the view from George Allen Kelly's patio. You'll see you're looking out uh, from his patio, um, across, out past his gazebo, and towards that pasture area I described a minute ago. And it's past that pasture area, past a dirt road, is where Gabriel fell and died. I want to show you the view from the other direction. This is the view through the pergola, or the gazebo, and back toward the area where George Allen Kelly was standing. And you'll see in that photograph, um, 
sort of on the right as you look through the gazebo, a door. That's not the main door into the residence. There are actually two doors on this back patio. There's another door that's directly behind that umbrella. And we'll show you another picture later um, that shows that door, but that's actually the door that George Kelly came out of. To the left of that in the photograph are two <coughs> windows. Those are the windows uh, to the living room area, and behind the living room area is actually the kitchen area. This is a photograph of the semi-automatic assault rifle, AK-47, that George Allen Kelly shot and killed Gabriel Quinn Bukimea with on January 30th. And I want to point out a few features on this weapon. There's a green strap on the weapon, and these um, details become relevant when you hear the when you hear the uh, officers talk about what they observed uh, George Kelly carrying later on in the day. So there's a green strap on the handgun, <coughs> pardon me, and you'll see that there are some wood features on the AK-47 also, and that the uh, metal on the weapon is a little bit aged from use. So you can kind of see that, um, I think they call it bluing, a little bluing on the weapon. And if you look on the, on the front end of the weapon, you'll see that taped with black electrical tape is a flashlight with an orange button on it. And just below the AK-47 is what's referred to as the magazine. Sometimes it's called the clip because that's what holds the bullets that clips inside the gun. And that magazine holds 30 rounds. And Rounds are what they refer to, how you refer to the bullets that go into an AK-47. They're called rounds. So this AK-47 holds 30 rounds. It also holds one round inside the weapon itself for a total of 31 rounds. And you'll hear from the experts in this case that this entire magazine can be expelled, can be shot, within less than six seconds. This is just the other side of the AK-47 for you to see, um, and a better view of that green strap that we referred to earlier. This is the 40 caliber handgun that George Kelly had on his hip that day when he exited his house. Now I want to go back to this view from George Kelly's patio um, because there may be something that you didn't notice about this photograph. And that is that off in the distance, there is a detective standing in this picture wearing a black polo shirt and a tan pair of pants. He's not a small detective. He's uh, about six feet tall. He's a good sized detective. And that detective is standing in the spot where Gabriel fell and died in this case. And that red circle with the red arrow is pointing you to where the detective is. And if you still can't see it, that yellow arrow is now pointing directly at the detective. That's how far Gabriel and Daniel were when the defendant opened fire on them that day. Now I want to turn to the area um, where Gabriel's body was located. This is a photograph of Gabriel, uh, Gabriel's body in place. And what you see in this photograph, first I want to point to the background of the photograph. You see some lights in the background? That is the Kelly residence. And so you can see them sort of off in the, in the, at the top part of the photograph, off in the distance. Now below the or in, just in front of that, you see it, a tree. Now keep your eye out for that tree because we're going to go through some other photographs and some drone footage later, and you'll want to have that as a marker when you're looking, when you're looking for things. In the foreground of the photograph is Gabriel's body, and you'll see that the grass was very high, 
and um, probably about two feet at the time, and it's that yellow straw grass. And you can see that Gabriel's body was very difficult to see in that terrain. Gabriel um, is wearing some tan boots, some tan pants, an olive colored jacket, and a camouflage backpack. This is a close up, a big uh, closer up picture of Gabriel. Again, you can see the tan boots, the tan jacket, or the tan pants, pardon me, the olive colored jacket, and you can see a camouflage fanny pack uh, along his side. And you can see the camouflage backpack, which is kind of up over his head. <coughs> And you can see from these photographs that Gabriel is unarmed. There are no weapons in these photographs. There were no weapons located near Gabriel's body. In this photograph, you can see the blood seeping through uh, Gabriel's jacket on his back where he was shot. And Gabriel was shot here on his back. And this is a close-up of the gunshot wound. You can see the gunshot you can see the gunshot entry wound um, on his green jacket. And you can see that the blood has seeped around on the jacket. Also in this photograph, you can see that strap from the fanny pack that's down along the side. In addition to the, um, let me just try to switch out here. We'll see if that works any better. Sorry for the interruptions, folks. You can also see in this photograph that um, Gabriel has a radio on his waist. So you can see the, the black um, uh, antenna from the radio sticking up on the side of him. And now I kind of want to give you some perspective on what we're looking at here. We looked at those photographs. We talked about what the terrain looks like. But you'll learn during this trial that we asked for, for some assistance from some other agencies. One of those agencies is the Department of Public Safety. And they have an aerial drone footage. And they came out with their aerial drone and they took some video footage and some photos of the terrain. And you'll see on the left, there's a, and, and what those drone, what that drone footage allows us to do is take really accurate measurements from those photographs. And you'll see they're overlaid on a computer screen. The, the um, officer who operates those aerial drones will be able to give you some real good idea how those, how those work. But essentially what the, uh, what the trooper did is he ran that aerial, dr aerial uh, drone over the area. And it gives you sort of like a bird's eye view of what that area looks like. And if you take a look, it's kind of hard to see in the photograph on your left um, but you'll see that there's an up and down line in blue, and that's the north-south line. And you'll see a, a line that goes left and right. That's your east-west line. That's in red. And the green line is measuring the distance from Kelly's back, back patio where he shot to the area where the victim's body was located. And it's kind of difficult to see the end of the green line, but can you see it's on the other side of that dirt road? That's the location where Gabriel's body was found. Now on your right, you'll see um, a, the still shot of the aerial drone footage. And I'm gonna play that aerial drone footage for you, but I kind of, it goes kind of quick, so I wanna give you a little bit of a preview of what you're gonna see. What you're looking at right now is like three quarters of the top of the Kelly residence. And you can also see the Kelly back patio there. You'll see there's a fountain. You might want to keep that in your mind as a reference when you're looking at some of these photographs. And to the right of that, you see some orange cones. It's sort of in that general vicinity um, that George Allen Kelly shot that day. And those are where we took the measurements from on the patio, was from that, those orange cones. And you'll learn throughout the trial that to the right of the orange cone is the area where the 
spent shell casings were located in this case. So just to give you some orientation on what you're looking at and what you're going to hear um, during the trial. But just past this patio, you'll see the gazebo that we saw in the other photograph. Then you'll see a pile of a metal structure on the right, it's some kind of smoking pit. And then you'll see a pile of wood just before a fence line. Then you'll see a pasture where the defendant keeps his horse. You'll see the second fence line. And then you'll see the dirt path, the dirt road, dirt path, just past that. And then it's past that that you see the tree we saw in the photographs, and then four orange cones that depict uh, the area where the victim's body was located, where he fell and died. So we're looking at the top of the house. That's the orange cones. We're going through the Pergola, there's the wood pile in the first fence line. And it's kind of difficult to see, but if you keep your eyes um, peeled, you'll start to see now the second fence line, and it sort of goes up at an angle to your left. And now you see the dirt road. And the tree and the four cones where um, Gabriel fell and died. <clears throat> and don't worry if you missed that second fence line, we're gonna play another video um, that, show, that goes a little bit slower and you can, you can have a better look. So on to the next video. Um, again, you see that same diagram on your left and on the right is the second drone video. So we're looking again at the top of the Kelly uh, roof, and then we're going to see that same thing, that patio, um, the pergola, or gazebo, and the smoking pit is that metal thing. Then you'll see the, the pile of wood, the fence line, and then keep your eyes peeled for a little bit for that second fence line and then the dirt road. And there are your orange cones the gazebo, the first fence line, and then now you can see the second fence line. And you can see it sort of goes off um, diagonally toward the, toward the road. Everybody see that? And then you see the dirt road? and the four, corn, four cones where Gabriel's body um, was located. And now just to sort of give you some orientation, um, because we looked at those photographs and we saw that Gabriel was shot here, and you could see that the house was this direction, and we know he was shot in the back. But to kind of give you perspective, we know that he fell forward, onto his face, into the dirt. And so to give you just, and this is not to scale, this is just for demonstrative purposes, so you get an idea of the orientation of the body. You can see that small little person we added there to that screen, that shows you the orientation of the body. So he was face down, head to the south, and feet to the north, with the um, bullet entry lined up with the back of the Kelly house where Kelly shot from. Now based on all of this information and based on what happened that day, George Kelly was charged with two things. He was charged with second degree murder and he was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. The second degree murder um, relates to the death of Gabriel and the aggravated assault with a deadly weapon uh, relates to the shooting at Daniel. So second degree murder is one of the more complicated crimes. Um, lucky you all, but it's what's called a unified offense. That means there's three ways that the state can prove second degree murder. You all don't have to agree on which theory of second degree murder um, the defendant committed, 
you only have to agree that he committed one of these theories of second degree murder. And you all have to you all have to be unanimous that he committed the murder. You can just decide that it, that there are different ways in which he committed it. So I'm going to talk to you about the three ways um, that the state can prove during this trial that the defendant committed the murder. The first way is by proving that the defendant intentionally killed Gabriel Glenn with the man. That he shot him, that he intentionally shot him, and that he caused his death. The second way is the state can prove that Kelly caused Gabriel's death by conduct that he knew would cause death or serious physical injury. So those are the two simple ways. The third way is the more complicated way, but it's also the easiest way. So you can, we can also prove that the defendant committed second degree murder by under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to human life, he recklessly engaged in conduct that created a grave risk of death and thereby caused Gabriel's death. So that he behaved recklessly, manifesting an extreme indifference to human life and that he created a grave risk of death and did cause the death. And the risk has to be such that disregarding it was a gross deviation from what a reasonable person would do in the circumstances. So that's second degree murder. One of those three ways is how the state proves that the defendant committed, um, committed second degree murder in this case. And I submit to you that the facts of this case the defendant is guilty on all three of those theories. The second count is aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And in aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, the state has to prove that Kelly intentionally placed Daniel in reasonable apprehension of eminent physical injury. In this case, that's by the conduct of shooting a gun in his direction. That would place anyone in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury. That means that they think they're about to get injured. That's pretty much what that means. And that he did so using a deadly weapon. We know he used his AK-47. And now I want to talk to you a little bit um, about the area where this occurred and sort of orient you on what was happening that day. This is just a map of Santa Cruz County, just to give you an idea of the location where this happened. We're in Nogales. Um, we can see that on the map there. We're in the area that's a little bit white. Um, all the major uh, residential areas in the county are on here. Rio Rico, um, Tubac, Sonoida, Elgin. And you can see those all on the map. You see the area circled in yellow. That is Tino Springs. That is the area where this event took place. And this area, this is a close up of the area that's at issue, which is really just south of the Tino Springs residential area. And you'll see um, to the right on this map in white is an area called Pedregoso Tanks. That's an area that's in the National Forest. And as I said, um, Keno Springs is, the residential part of Keno Springs is just to the north of this. And Nogales, where we are today, is just to the west of this area. And to the northeast of this area is Patagonia. And you'll see along the bottom here is the United States-Mexico border. And you'll see this area where the arrow points is right where the border wall ends. You'll see like a dirt road that comes right up from the map where that arrow points um, that the border wall ends. That is right where the border wall ends, right where that road comes directly up from the end of, of the border wall there. Over on the right of this map is the National Forest. And the National Forest, right where the border wall ends is where the National Forest begins. And on January 30th of 2023, let me go back to that map for a second. Daniel Ramirez and Gabriel Quen Bukimea 
were with a with a group of undocumented migrants, illegal immigrants, who crossed the border illegally at the end of the border wall. And they crossed the border really early that morning and they hiked up into the national forest. And they've been hiking all day in that area. And you're gonna learn for, you're gonna meet Daniel. Daniel's gonna come here and testify. And you're gonna learn that Daniel is a really humble guy. Daniel comes from Honduras and Daniel um, had spent many years in Mexico. He has a fifth or sixth grade education and he generally works as a farmhand um, on a small, um, in a small village in Mexico. And you'll learn that obviously for someone with his educational background and with his occupation, he struggles um, to get by in the off season. And in sometime before January of 2023, he was working a masonry job during the off season in Nogales, Sonora. And he, he met Gabriel Juan Butimea. And he and Gabriel started talking about getting work in the United States as a roofer. And as they talked, um, Daniel decided that sounded like a good idea. And so he paid illegal um, folks to, tr to um, come across the line illegally. He paid a fee to come across the line. And you'll hear that Daniel was um, traveling across and up and through the national forest that day with Gabriel and, and with a group of men, about seven, seven or eight people all together. And they were traveling up through the national forest. They traveled most of the day. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon and they encountered some border patrol officers. And so they decided to scatter. They took off running all in different directions. Gabriel and Daniel stayed together and they decided they were gonna go back into Mexico and just give this a try another day. And so they were running, fleeing from Border Patrol, running pretty fast for about a half an hour. And it was at about that time that they decided they were gonna take a little bit of a rest. They were, they were worn out from running, um, they're headed back to Mexico, and they're gonna slow down and take a rest. And Daniel didn't even have time to register that there was a residence around. The only thing Daniel saw was a red horse, a skinny red horse. And he saw that horse off to his right. He's walking along a dirt path, um, dirt path is sort of off to their right, and he sees this skinny red horse off to his right. And they're walking along and they see this skinny red horse and out of nowhere, a barrage of semi-automatic assault rifle fire comes their direction. And they're walking and Daniel sees Gabriel just a few feet ahead of him get hit in the back with an assault rifle fire, with the assault rifle fire. And he sees him grab his chest and say, I'm hit and he sees him fall in front of him and die. And then Gabriel, because the shots are still ringing out all around him, takes off running and runs for the border, running for his life. Now at around 2.30 that day, George Kelly came to his house to have some lunch. And he was in his kitchen, making his lunch at his kitchen island, when he sees something outside that catches his attention. And just started to give you a little bit of an idea, George Kelly's house is about a, a little less than a mile and a half from the United States-Mexico border. His property is about 170 acres, and it's surrounded by a large ranch, the Buena Vista Ranch. The Buena Vista Ranch is on the west side of his property, so the Nogales side, and the south side of his property. On the east side of his property is National Forest, and to the north is that Kino Springs residential area. 
And George Kelly was in his house that day making his lunch when he saw something outside that caught his attention. Instead of calling 911, he has his 40 caliber handgun on his hip. He goes to his back door, grabs his AK-47, and tells his wife to call the Border Patrol, to call the Border Patrol ranch liaison specifically. And his name is Jeremy Morcell. And so Wanda Kelly picks up her phone, calls the Border Patrol, and George Kelly goes outside and lets off a barrage of semi-automatic assault rifle fire. These are the two weapons that George Kelly had that day. We've already talked about those. And again, this is the view from George Kelly's back patio where he went out and let off that semi-automatic assault rifle fire. And that's the area where Gabriel and Daniel were that Gabriel fell and died. This is Jeremy Morcell. Jeremy Morcell is that ranch liaison that um, George Allen Kelly's wife called that day. The job of a ranch liaison is kind of just what it sounds like. Border Patrol needs to have access to properties that are close to the border in order to do their work. And so they work hard to have good relationships with people who are near the border. And the ranch liaison's job is to facilitate that access um, to those properties, to work with the residents to have them allow the Border Patrol to have access, and also to facilitate communication with those folks to make sure those folks know when there's an operation going on so they can stay out of the way, um, so they don't, uh, don't put themselves in the middle of an operation, and so that the homeowners can communicate with the Border Patrol if there's any information that they wanna pass on to help Border Patrol with their job. So that's what Jeremy Morcell's job is. So this day at 2.30, George Kelly uh, calls Jeremy Marcel, and he says to George, I'm being shot at and I'm shooting back. He says, I can't talk right now. There's five people all running southbound with packs. And Jeremy Marcel will tell you that during that phone conversation, George Kelly was very rushed and very frantic on the phone call. And you're gonna wonder, Kim, why are you giving me all these details about these phone calls and these statements? It's because throughout the day, these stories shift from moment to moment with Mr. Kelly. And it'll be important for you to take good notes about what Mr. Kelly says and when he says it and when that story changes because that's a shifting story throughout the day. So that was the first call. While that call is happening, Agent Morcell is um, talking to the appropriate people in his dispatch center, um, making sure that Border Patrol gets dispatched out and also making sure the Sheriff's Department gets dispatched out because Mr. Kelly has said there's a shooting going on. About 2.36, Jeremy Morcell calls Kelly back. At this time, Kelly gives him a slightly different story. He tells him he had an altercation with these people and they're headed toward Kino Springs, which is now the opposite direction that he said during the first phone call. And he says something about maybe they're trying to circle back or something of that nature. He says on this call, not I'm being shot at and I'm shooting back, but I heard a gunshot in my direction and he saw his horse running by. And it's unclear in this phone conversation, is he outside when he hears the gunshot or is he inside when he hears the gunshot? And that changes again later, whether he's inside or he's outside when he hears this alleged gunshot. A gunshot, by the way, that no one else hears other than George Allen Kelly. When he's on this conversation at 236, 
with Jeremy Morsell, he says that he's inspecting his horse and that it doesn't look like his horse was shot. Now the horse is gonna be important because you're gonna hear from Daniel about the horse and how Daniel believes that the horse got shot. And he believed at the time that the horse got shot and he thought the horse saved his life. From his view of what was happening at that time, that's what he thought happened. And clearly George Allen Kelly also thought something happened to his horse because he's busy inspecting him at this point. George said that, that and this is the important piece of this phone conversation, the people were too far away to tell if they had any kind of firearms. 115 yards away, they were too far away to tell if they had any firearms. George Allen Kelly could not tell if they had any firearms. And we saw that from the picture we saw a few minutes ago about the location where Gabriel fell and died. During this phone conversation, he was quite a bit calmer than he was during that second phone conversation. So the next thing that happens is officers have been dispatched out and the Border Patrol gets there really quick. They're there within about 10 minutes. Um, this is a pretty remote area, so that quick of a response time is, is pretty, pretty great. So when the Border Patrol arrives, um, the first Border Patrol agent, there's two Border Patrol agents in total who, who go out to the scene during this first call for service, and five sheriff's deputies respond. When the first deputy arrives, um, or the first Border Patrol agent arrives, he learns that Mr. Kelly is headed south um, in the property, that he's taken off south from his house on the property. And before they go looking for Mr. Kelly, they decide they're gonna search the area of the house for any kind of immediate danger. So they kind of split up, um, but actually six of them because the fifth deputy doesn't get there until pretty much everything's done. Um, so the six of them split up, they search that immediate area of the pasture by the house they search the area around the house and they tell Mrs. Kelly, stay in the house, we're gonna go, we're gonna go look around. The Border Patrol agents head off, they just sort of hike straight across the, the property and you'll see that they locate Mr. Kelly about a quarter mile south of the house, um, not far from a barn and a, and a mechanical pump house, like it's a pump house where you pump water from a well in the ground. So it's got a little pump house. And it's down in that area that the Border Patrol find him. And when they do find him, by the way, they see him walking with his dogs. He's carrying an AK-47. And there's they don't locate anyone else. No, none of the deputies, none of the Border Patrol locate anyone else uh, while they're there. This is a, a map just to give you an idea of the Kelly property. And you'll see at the top of the map in white is the Kelly residence. You'll see that area in blue is the area of the residence. And around the edge of the blue line is about where Gabriel's body was located. The area in green is the barn. Um, they have a big metal barn. It's that metal barn near that area and this yellow circle is the is the pump house. It's in that area where the um, Border Patrol find Mr. Kelly walking in that location. Just one other thing for you to note for the property, there's also an area here of corrals and some water troughs that may at some point during the trial, you, you may wanna know where those are just to give you an idea. And you'll see that there's a dirt road that goes through the property um, that's the just the Kelly's uh, sort of driveway through their property. And you'll also see in this map that there's a, a wash that one runs through the Kelly property. You can kind of see that in the drone footage we looked at. Off in the background, you can see a little piece of the dirt road and you can see the, see the um, wash that's kind of down below. But those are just some items for you to have an idea of so that they may become important during this trial. Ms. Holden, Ms. Holden. Yes, sir. 
Court reporter has been going for about an hour and a half, and uh, they need a break as to the interpreters. Keep them going too much farther beyond that, but all the data we have suggests generally that they are prone to mistakes. So we'll take a 10 minute recess uh, and um, we'll continue with the opening statement. So we were talking about um, about 3 o'clock, 3.15 that afternoon, uh, the Border Patrol located Mr. Kelly and they found him walking with his dogs and he was carrying his AK-47. It was that AK-47 that has the green strap on it with the wood um, pieces to it and the, and the metal. And one of the officers actually noticed that the AK-47 had a flashlight taped to the end of it with black electrical tape. And during this call for service, the officers had all split up into separate teams. So they took three separate statements from Mr. Kelly during this time. And we'll go through those uh, during the trial, uh, but we're not gonna go through all of them here today. This is the first statement that George Kelly gave about three o'clock or 3.15 to Deputy Castaneda. And Deputy Castaneda was the lead, lead officer uh, for the Sheriff's Department that responded to this first call for service that day. And what George Kelly told um, Deputy Castaneda is that he was standing in his kitchen, which is sort of in that red dot area on the house. Um, and he looked through his kitchen um, there's a there's a wall between the kitchen and the living room and it has like a cutout or a counter. So he looks through the cutout um, and from the kitchen, through the cutout, through the living room and out the living room windows and he sees uh, movement outside. He says that he sees five people running south from that view. Again, that's the living room windows. We looked at those pictures a minute ago. You're looking at the back of the house. And so you see the living room windows, the living room, that wall, the cutout for the counter, and then the kitchen island. And he was standing at that kitchen island. This is that other photograph. You see now why I included the photograph that was not a crime scene photograph that has um, other vegetation that showed that other door um, because this is a dark photograph and it's harder to see. But in this photograph, you can see both doors. You can see the door to the right, which is the door into the master bedroom. And you can see the door on the left, which is the door into the main living areas of the house. That's the door circled in blue that George Kelly came out that day. And on the left are those, are those two kitchen windows. And what Kelly said he did was that he went to that east door, he grabbed his AK-47 that he keeps by the door, and he went outside and he saw people were possibly carrying rifles. That's what he tells Castaneda during this, um, this interview. So we know this is different from what he told um, Agent Marcel on the phone. He told Agent Marcel they were too far away to tell and now this time he says they're possibly carrying a rifle. And then he goes on to say that he heard a single gunshot from an AK-47. And he believed that the people had encountered another cartel and they shot at them to scare them off and that's why he saw them running. He said he saw the people approximately 100 to 150 yards away from the residence and that after that, he never saw them again. So all he sees is people 100 to 150 yards away from the residence, and he never sees them again. He says he walked back through his property to locate the people, but he didn't find them, and that's when the police arrived. He says, he tells Castaneda, he believes there's way more of them than he saw out there but he's just speculating. He doesn't really know or have any reason um, to make that speculation. He's just speculating. And Castaneda tells Kelly that if anything like that happens again, stay inside your house and call 911. And Kelly says something very interesting at that time. Kelly says, he understands Castaneda's given him advice, but he's gonna do 
what he had to do to protect his property, he was conscious of the consequences, and he would take responsibility for his actions. The deputy reiterated to him again, stay inside and call 911. Here's the important part about all of these three statements that he gave to law enforcement that day. He never one time admitted that he shot his AK-47. He never told law enforcement that anyone pointed a gun at him. And he never told law enforcement that he was in fear for his life at any point that day. The next um, thing that happens in this case is Deputy Marcel gets another phone call after law enforcement leaves that day. And that phone call comes in about 4.23 that afternoon. And Deputy Marcel, I, I believe, is already off duty at this point, and he takes the call from Kelly. And Mr. Kelly tells him that he's very thankful for the responsiveness and how quickly the agents got there. And he wants to meet up the following day to sort of debrief about what happened. And Agent Marcel will tell you that that's kind of a normal thing if there's some kind of border patrol incident, that the, that the ranch liaison will go meet up with the homeowner. So that wasn't an odd request by Mr. Kelly that day. He said that during this phone conversation, Mr. Kelly just started rambling on um, during the phone conversation. And he was getting super excited about what had happened earlier that day. And then he started telling the story again about what happened. And he started sort of, uh, embellishing on what he told him earlier that day. He said he and Wanda were in the house and they heard a gunshot. And now you'll hear this is different. Instead of hearing the gunshot when he's outside, he's hearing the gunshot from the inside. And we went out onto the porch. He went out to, onto the porch and he saw his horse running by. And Wanda saw it too. There were 10 people all loaded down with AR style rifles 10 to 15 of them had rifles. So this is the this is the story at 4:23. And again, um, the agent will tell you that he was super amped up during this phone during this phone conversation, um, differently than his conversation earlier in the day. An hour goes by, and Jeremy Marcel misses the phone call. Um, George Allen Kelly. And this is the phone call that he missed. Voice bell. Jim, this is Alan Kelly. You need to call me immediately. This is serious. Call me immediately. I can't say more over the phone. Bye. Then after that, voicemail message, which Jeremy Marcel will tell you that was an unusual tone of voice for Mr. Kelly. He got this text message at 526, also saying, call me immediately. Agent Marcel, about 535, at this point, he's off duty. He's actually at the gym working out, and he just didn't hear his phone ring. Um, when it called the first time, when he called the first time, he didn't catch the text message, and he happens to walk over and notice that he's missed a text and missed a call, and so he tries returning Mr. Kelly's call. They kind of play some phone tag back and forth. They're both trying to call one another. Eventually, they connect um, on the phone, and there's another phone conversation at 5:35. During this phone conversation, Mr. Ke Kelly's demeanor is completely changed. He's evasive, he's nervous, he's scared, and his demeanor is totally different. He's a totally different person. During that fourth phone conversation, Kelly says, this is worse than you can imagine. This is bad. And he just kept repeating that. Marcel then offers to him to send out um, the sheriff's department and uh, the border patrol. And he tells him, just tell me what's happening so that I can tell folks what you need. And Jeremy and Mr. Kelly tells him, um, is continuing to be evasive. And Marcel then suggests that Kelly call 911. If he needs help, if something's happening, that he should call 911. 
Kelly says to him, you need to get border patrol. This is a border related issue. And then he tells him, you know how shots were fired earlier? Something was possibly struck. And as Marcel continues to push for additional details, Kelly tells him, I can't tell you more over the phone. And then he asks Marcel, is this being reported? He somehow thought that a conversation with a law enforcement officer wasn't going to be reported if it was the Border Patrol. So Mr. Kelly did not take Agent Morsell's advice. He did not call 911. But Agent Morsell called his dispatch, and his dispatch called 911. And then 911 called Mr. Kelly. And when 911 called Mr. Kelly, the, night, the dispatcher had a very interesting conversation with Mr. Kelly. When she first speaks to Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kelly says, it's very serious, ma'am, and I can't, I'm not gonna talk over the telephone. Yeah, I know I can talk to you, but you're responsible for what I say, and I'm responsible for what I say. Uh, I didn't shoot at any, I haven't said I shot at any, and then his voice quivers and he says anything. I don't want to get you in trouble, and I, I don't want to get me in trouble. Okay, he sighs. You know, you know the thing, you have the right to remain silent, and anything you say can and will be held against you in a court of law. I'm not, I'm not admitting to anything I've done, but all those things tend to add up. And I don't know what happened, I just know, I just know what I saw about 15 minutes ago. And then when the, when he eventually gets to the point that he's marked a body with a flashlight, he tells her, I have it marked, I've got a flashlight on over it. And the dispatcher says to him, do you know who it is that you saw? And he says, no, I didn't say I saw any body. I just saw a body. And then he goes on to say, and from, from what in that, in that I only approached the body to make sure that the, that the animal, uh, it's not a vegetable or a mineral, the animal wasn't alive and it was not alive. There was no signs of blood. Uh, there was just a, a, an animal laying face down, an animal. And you know what an animal is. It's not a vegetable or a mineral, it's a body. And you know what I'm talking about. But I think more than the words of what he said to dispatch, when you hear the tone of what he says during this call, you'll see the impact of what it is that he's saying. Department had four or five guys out here this afternoon investigating a 
border patrol drugs running in. Uh-huh. Uh, and I don't, and I don't know if you, I can't remember the, the officer's name. There was two gentlemen and two young ladies. Uh-huh. Uh, maybe third. And, do you know who I'm talking about? They came out to 100 Willow Cross Circle. You, you mean for my deputies, correct? And yeah, they were, they were. Yeah, no worry. What happened here? Uh huh. You're aware. Okay, then they're aware of what happened, and uh, I don't want to get you in trouble, and I, I don't want to get me in trouble, or I, but I don't want to break the law or anything like that. So what I'm telling you is that uh, we need a sheriff deputy out here, 100 Willow Cross Circle, immediately, and that's all I can say, ma'am. Okay, is uh, anyone hurt? that I only approached the body to make sure that the animal uh, 
uh, it's not a vegetable or a mineral. The okay. animal wasn't alive and it was not alive. Okay. Uh, there were no signs. There was no signs of blood. Uh, there was just a uh, uh, an animal laying face down. An animal? An animal, and you know what an animal is. It's not a vegetable or a mineral. It's a body, and you know what I'm talking about. I understand what you're talking about, Rich. Um, okay, I'm going to send the deputy then over to your house so you can lead them over to wherever you found what it is. Okay. okay? And now, uh, maybe one of the deputies were out here. They know how to get here because it's 100 Willowcroft Circle, and it's kind of hard to find. It's a rat right on the border. So, so I have one of my deputies that responded earlier going over your way. That's good. You do that. They know how to get here, and I'll have the gate open. I appreciate your help and your patience, and I'm sorry if no I... No Okay. Okay. Bye. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. It was just a few minutes after that um, that the first deputy arrived for this second call for service, and that was Deputy Rafael Lopez. And Deputy Lopez had responded to the scene earlier in the day, but he was one of the later deputies. He was that later deputy who got there after really everything had finished up earlier in the day. And what Deputy Lopez did when he got there was he turned on his recorded recorder. And he recorded um, as soon as he arrived at the scene for a few minutes of what George Kelly was reporting to him. And this is that recording. Somebody had shot there was a shot fire and I didn't know what it was about. Okay. So I went out to get the horse, I always bring him in and feed him, put him in another pasture. I went out there to get him. And y'all guys, did you you weren't over here? Yeah, I was Y'all walked all over there. And the border patrol worked all over. And I, maybe this happened after you left. Well, I don't know. The right? There's a body right now. And I don't even find Yeah. About fresh. I didn't think I didn't as soon as I saw it, I backed away from it. It's lying flexible.
over here. Okay, I'll, I'll pick the five eights over here. Shortly after this, um, Sergeant Omar Rodriguez arrives at the scene. And Sergeant Rodriguez meets up with Deputy Lopez and George Kelly by a horse trailer that's down by a gate um, into, the, into the pasture area of where the, um, where the horse was kept in the, by the house. And what's, when Sergeant Rodriguez arrived at about 6.15, he saw that Kelly was wearing that block handgun um, still on his hip. And he asked Mr. Kelly if he would be willing to take that handgun off for officer safety reasons and leave it behind in the trailer. And Mr. Kelly agreed to do that. He took the weapon off and left it um, in his horse trailer that's right next to the gate in that pasture. From there, Kelly took Rodriguez out to the body. And they walked around on that dirt path that goes around from the from the driveway that you saw that dirt road that's the driveway they took the dirt path around the outside of the pasture back to where the body was located and they found the body near that tree that we saw and the defendant had taped had hung up a flashlight in the tree so that they could locate it because it was starting to get dark and as I mentioned before, the sergeant found the uh, Gabriel's body laying face down with his head toward the south, with his face implanted in the dirt. And his um, legs were towards the north. So, and we, we showed a little picture of that earlier and how the body was positioned. And when, when, um, Sergeant Rodriguez got a good look at the body. He could see the gunshot entry wound in Gabriel's back. And he could see that that was on the right side of his body, which then lined up with the Kelly's residence. Later, they were able to look and discover that the gunshot exited from the chest. He made another, a number of other observations about the body. He saw that there was no pulse. Um, the extremities were, were cool, but the torso was still a little warm to the touch. He looked around the area because of the story that Mr. Kelly had about these other people and, and things of that nature. He looked around and he saw there weren't any drag marks. There wasn't a blood trail. There was nothing to indicate there were groups of people nearby. He saw nothing like that in the area. And nothing at all to indicate that a body had somehow been dumped there or anything of that nature. It appeared to, the, to Sergeant Rodriguez as if Gabriel had fallen there and died. And he noted, as I said before, that that gunshot wound generally lined up with the trajectory to where George Kelly was shooting from on his back patio. And again, just a reminder of the photograph of how he found the body. And I think we've already gone through all this, but it, it kind of shows you where that gunshot wound was lining up with the residence. And again, just the body positioning with that tiny little stick figure to just show you how the body was lining with the gunshot entry on the house side. Now, a short while, a little while later, after they do their investigation there at the scene and they gather the information about what had happened earlier in the day from all their sources, George Kelly's transported um, to the sheriff's department for an interview. He's read his Miranda rights and a video interview is conducted of him. And this is the still shot from that video interview that happened about 8.29 p.m. that night. So we're talking 
maybe six hours after the homicide. And you'll learn that during that interview, George Kelly tells Detective Ayanisa that he was eating lunch in the kitchen, and when he looked out through the living room window, and he heard a shot. Now he's in the house when he hears, hears the shot, before he's outside when he hears the shot. He hears a shot, it's close, and he saw, sees his horse running by. He says about 100 to 150 yards out, he sees men running with tan shirts and pants with a full brown, big, solid backpack on. He then clarifies that he saw them, and then he heard the shot after he came outside. And he says that he saw them run into the arroyo. He told this whole story without admitting that he shot his AK-47. Never admitted he shot his AK-47. It was about 30 minutes into the interview, and after Detective Ainsa pressed him about conversations that Kelly had earlier with um, Agent Morcell, when George Kelly finally admitted he shot his AK-47 that day. He says to Agent, or to, uh, pardon me, Detective Ainsa, that they were running and he moves his hand from left to right, parallel with me. They were parallel to the house. I'm telling you the truth, I made, did not make the statement that I shot somebody or shot at or shot somebody or shot, period. So then he's denying that he even told Agent Morsell that he had shot his AK-47. And when Detective Ainsa presses him and says, did you shoot? George Kelly admits, yes, he shot. And then he claims that he shot over their heads. And when Detective Ainsa asks him, how far were they when you shot him? George Kelly says, 150 yards. Well, we know where Gabriel's body was discovered, 115 yards from the back of the Kelly residence. And why did you shoot at them when they were running away from you? Detective Ainsa asks. And Kelly says, because when you're out there in that situation and, and you have people that, that they weren't running away from me, they were just running. And you said earlier that they were running away. They were running across, hand moves from, again, his hands moving from left to right, across the wash. And then he clarifies that they were running 100 to 150 yards away again. And then he says, now he says they're armed. And the detective then asks him, when they were running with the rifle, did they ever point their rifle at you? Up until this point, George Allen Kelly has never said a peep about these individuals pointing a gun at him. And we know based on what he told Agent Morcell earlier that they were way too far away for him to see if they had any handguns or had any kind of weapon. And what Kelly says at this point is he says, if a guy's running and, and, and he turns, he's going to turn and he's going to point it at you just in a, just in a mode of turning. He's going to point it at you. So yes, they turned the rifle and pointed it towards And again, that's with the knowledge that we already have, that he already told Agent Morcell that they were too far away for him to tell if they had weapons. So what's important about the statement that Kelly made to Agent, or to Detective Ainsa? He didn't admit he shot his AK-47 until 30 minutes into the, into the interview, and that's because he had something to hide. He knew he'd kill Gabriel. He didn't say anyone pointed a gun at him until Di Detective Ainsa asked him about it. And he didn't say he was in fear for his life until Detective Ainsa suggested it to him. 
Now, after this interview with George Kelly, late into the evening of January 30th of 2023 and early into the morning of January 31st of 2023, detectives Aisa and other members of his team worked to serve a series of search warrants. They serve some search warrants on the house. Um, they serve some search warrants on the vehicles and the surrounding outbuildings. And you'll hear that during that series of search warrants, um, they recovered the AK-47 that we showed you in the picture that was used in this incident. They asked for assistance from a small department. So we asked for assistance not just from the Department of Public Safety, but also for, from ATF. They have a, a dog that can sniff for explosives and can find uh, spent casings. And so we utilize their canine uh, to look for the spent casings. And in this case, we're talking a very high powered rifle that um, went through, through and through the body and into the desert. That projectile could be up to a mile away. That projectile was not covered, recovered by the ATF canine, and it was not recovered, even based on detectives' efforts with a metal detector. The officers did recover nine fresh AK-47 casings near the back patio of George Kelly's residence. And the first one was actually discovered by the canine. Um, and I'll show you that photograph in a minute. The other eight casings were discovered by um, Detective Joe Bunting, who's now Sergeant Joe Bunting. He found those um, looking during the daylight uh, the following morning, and with him, he also had a metal detector, I believe. But again, because of the terrain and the type of weapon used, the projectile was not recovered in this case. So we talked a little bit about the weapon earlier, the AK-47, and we talked about the bullets or the rounds, but I've been using a phrase that I didn't explain to you, and that is the spent casing. So the bullet or the, or the um, round has several parts to it. It has the projectile, that's the piece of metal that's on the top that you can see that's shiny um, on, the, on the bullet that's in this picture. And then on the bottom is the dark, darker part and that part's called the casing. And inside the casing are the explosives that cause the projectile to um, spew out at the top of the, of the round. And so what's left over and what ejects from the weapon is called the spent casing. That's just that metal piece that's left over that the explosives are now out of and the projectile is not out of. So nine casings were recovered uh, around the area of George Kelly's back patio. And on the right in these pictures, is that your right? Yes. Is the spent casings. On the left, you can see the see the rounds or the or the bullets. Now during that search warrant, I indicated that uh, detectives found the semi-automatic assault rifle, the AK-47. It was in George Kelly's bedroom and it was behind the door and it had a sweater over it. Um, George Kelly told the detectives that he always keeps that weapon by his back patio door. It was not there that day when detectives came. And in fact, what you'll hear is that um, it was really late when detectives were there. They took that photograph on the left the first time they were there and they left the AK-47 behind. They had to come during their second search warrant, they came back and recovered the AK-47. Um, but that is the AK-47. It was in the same spot when they came back and they did recover it during the second search warrant. This is the ATF canine that found the first um, casing in this case. And you can see the, the tent, the evidence tent is where that first casing was located. The next day, um, you can see detectives have located the other eight casings in this case. And just to give you an idea of where those casings are located, this is just a still shot of that aerial drone footage we looked at. And you can see the yellow circle is where the eight casings were discovered by the detectives. 
and the one in blue is the one casing that was dis discovered by the canine. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's uh, almost noon. Let's break for the lunch hour. I don't have any additional information about the water situation. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we were talking about this visual that is up on the screen now. And the reason why I was showing you this visual again is I wanted to tell you that you're going to hear some testimony from two officers from the Department of Public Safety from the aerial photographs. And they also did uh, something called a Leica scan of the area. And a Leica scan is a more detailed uh, type of analysis where they take really detailed measurements so that they can do measurements um, of the scene that are accurate and to scale. And so uh, this is the drone photo with the measurements, uh, but you'll also hear from a sergeant captain who did the, the Leica scan for us as well. And then again, as I indicated, uh, Trooper Reyna is going to testify about the drone uh, footage. The next officers you're going to hear from um, are an FBI agent who assisted the detectives in downloading Mr. Kelly's cell phone. Um, our detectives aren't up to speed, or weren't at the time up to speed on some new cell phone data called Cellbrite. And that data, that software is what we use to download people's cell phones. So we can look at their text messages, their photos, and, the, and their phone calls, those sorts of things. And so the FBI, you'll hear from the FBI agent who assisted with that download. And you'll hear from Detective Mario Barba. He's actually the tall detective that was in that photograph you saw. Um, so you'll meet him when he comes in to talk about those uh, cell phone downloads. And he did something called a physical download of the defendant's cell phone. You'll learn that the defendant's cell phone was kind of an older model phone, so the Cellbrite um, software at, wasn't actually able to open it because the software was old on it. And so what we actually had to do was go through the phone and physically examine and take photographs of things as opposed to the normal download we would do. And you're going to hear about some of those text messages. And they really give you some insight into what was happening with George Kelly in the weeks leading up to the homicide. And you'll see, this is just sort of a flavor of those text messages, and you'll see all of them as we um, go through the, the testimony from Detective Barba and Agent um, Douglas. And this is kind of the flavor. Uh, he's sending texts to his friend a couple of weeks before the homicide saying, overrun with drug cartel, <coughs> AK getting a lot of work. Pick of drug runner carpet tracks, and one of the CBP agents will explain what carpet tracks are to you. Those are essentially booties that migrants use to try to cover their um, sign as they're walking through the desert. That they call them carpet. Um, Your Honor, can we have a conference briefly? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. As I was saying, uh, the first text message talks about Mr. Kelly on January 13th of 2023, which is just two weeks before the homicide, is texting his friend Gary Miller, overrun with drug, drug cartel, AKA getting a lot of work. And then a second one, pick of drug runner carpet tracks, 33 dealt with this week, AKA hot, AKA hot. And then you'll see there's actually a text to his son on that same day. His son is Matt Kelly. And that text message says, 33 drug runners this week. Pick attached is a drug runner carpet booty. AK-47 hot. Want to be backup? And his son responds with a note and a, and a hand emoji with the thumb down. And he says, be careful. And Mr. Kelly responds, careful is not an option. It's either fight or run, and I'm too old to run. Mom is L and L or locked and loaded also. So that's uh, some of the text messages that you're going to see. 
And you're also going to hear from a number of expert witnesses in this case. One of the expert witnesses you're going to hear from is Aaron Brunel, and he's a weapons specialist. He's going to come in and talk to you about the functionality of the AK-47, that it actually works. He's going to tell you that the AK-47 matches to the casings that were located on the defendant's patio, that we showed you uh, those nine casings earlier in the photographs. He's going to talk about something called an ejection pattern for the AK-47. He's going to talk to you about and what that means essentially is when the spent casings eject from the AK-47, what pattern do they normally land in? That's called an ejection pattern. So he'll talk to you about what the ejection pattern for this weapon is, and you'll learn um, why that's important from the experts as they testify. He's also going to talk to you about an examination of the victim's clothing. He's going to tell you that he didn't see any soot or any stippling. And what that tells you is that this was not a close-up shot. We know it wasn't a close-up shot. We know Mr. Kelly shot from his back patio. But this just confirms that determination. Next, you're going to hear from two other experts from the Arizona Department of Public Safety Crime Lab, and they're both forensic scientists as well. And these two forensic scientists did some work essentially just to check the boxes to make sure. Um, we don't expect that on a casing we're going to find any DNA or any fingerprints. And that's because of how hot it is inside the weapon. Um, that just burns off any DNA or any fingerprints. <laughs> But we went ahead and checked those casings anyway for fingerprints and DNA, and we didn't find any fingerprints on the casings, and we also preserved whatever was on, was on the casings as far as DNA goes. But again, that was really just a checkbox, um, not really expecting to find anything. The next outside expert witness you're going to hear from is a man named Rick Wyant. And Rick Wyatt is also a forensic scientist. He has his own consulting company, but he also works for a state crime lab in another state. <coughs> Mr. Wyatt is the shooting reconstructionist in this case. He's the ballistics expert. <coughs> He's going to talk to you about the shooting reconstruction and also about something called bullet wobble. Um, you'll see that he'll talk to you a little bit about how the shape of the entry wound is for the gunshot wound and that there was a little bit of wobble on that and he'll explain to you what that could be caused by. Hitting a little branch or, a, or something like that along the way, um, on the way that it hit um, Gabriel. The next expert witness you're going to hear from is Tara Telsell. Yeah, Ms. Telsell is a scientist um, from RJ Lee Labs, and you'll hear that this, um, this information that she's going to pro provide you comes from trace examination of the victim's clothing. And this was, again, just to determine um, if this is a close-up shot or a far shot. And she'll explain to you what her findings are when she's here. You're also going to hear from the medical examiner from the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office that did the exam of the forensic autopsy of Gabriel in this case. And she's going to describe for you um, the injuries to the, uh, to the victim in this case. And I'm going to show you a couple of photographs from the autopsy that show you the entry and the exit wound. This is the entry wound on Gabriel's back. And Dr. Uh, Tim will explain to you the the, all of the dimensions of the wound and what that means. And this is the exit wound on Gabriel's chest. And she'll explain to you again what all of those, um, what all of the measurements mean and how she knows which is entry and which is exit wound. The other she, thing she's going to tell you is that she didn't find any stippling or any soot around the entry wound in this case. And again, that's an indication that this is not a close-up shot. And then finally, she's going to talk to you about the path of the projectile in this case. She's going to talk to you about how the projectile entered through these three ribs back here. 
and essentially blew out those ribs and traveled through the ribs, through the um, <coughs> through the right lung, through the pericardial sac, through the ascending aorta, through the sternum, through the parasternal anterior left second rib, and then out. And she's going to give you all the details uh, about that injury and what that means in terms of how, how long he might have lived, what that means with respect to how he could have responded um, immediately following the shooting. She'll tell you all about those details. But the one thing that I want to make sure I leave you with is that when we're talking about the evidence in the, this case, I want to remind you of the words of George Allen Kelly. And I want to remind you that Mr. Kelly told you, I'm not, I'm not admitting to anything I've done, but all those things tend to add up. And they do add up in this case. And they add up to second degree murder and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. All of the items of evidence point toward that. We've got the ballistics and the bullet trajectory, the medical examiner's testimony, the fact that Gabriel's body is 115 yards away from the Kelly residence. The fact that Kelly says that the individuals he saw were 100 to 150 yards away from his residence. The location of the, location of the casing. The ejection pattern that you'll learn about from the experts. The information about the horse that you heard from, hear from Daniel and that is corroborated by the defendant's conversation with Jeremy Morcell. The fact that no one heard that alleged first shot except George Allen Kelly. There's no soot or stippling on the wounds indicating this is not a close-up shot. And Kelly admits that he shot his AK-47 and we have matched the casings by his patio to his AK-47. And Kelly admits that these people weren't coming toward his house. They weren't approaching him. They weren't any kind of threat to him. They were going parallel to his residence. And I just mentioned the AK-47 matched the casings. And then finally, you'll have the testimony of Daniel, who will tell you what he observed that day. And all of those things will lead you to find that the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's guilty of these charges. Will leave you, the state's evidence will leave you firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt in this case. The defendant has, has told the officer that he was conscious of the consequences of his actions and he would take responsibility for those actions. We're going to ask you to hold him to that and to find him guilty at the end of this trial of these two charges, second degree murder with the death of Gabriel Coinbukimea and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon for Daniel Ramirez. 